So I wanted to ask you if you can imagine what it feels like to be out of work or perhaps what it feels like to be stuck in a dead-end job that you are desperate to get out of. If you're out of work in Britain, there's a service for you. You can go to an office that looks like this, you can join a queue, and you get help filling out job applications online, and you get a benefits check. And over the decades, uh, the benefits check has been reduced quite a bit, and the job application forms have been put online. But basically, if you were a time traveller from the 1940s when these services were designed, you could join the queue at the job centre today and you would pretty much know exactly what to do. And these services, which cost billions to run, have a 66% failure rate. So when I spend time in the job centre, I meet people going around for the second, the third, even the 15th time. And I think it's not surprising because we're going through this so-called fourth industrial revolution and the world of work is being dramatically transformed and continues to be transformed at real pace. So it's not surprising that these services which were designed in such a different era no longer work. So I tried an experiment. I went to a local job centre and I persuaded the person who manages the job centre to let me put up this false door. And I put up this huge poster which said get me out of here. And I said to anybody in the job centre, if you give me five pounds, like five euros, five dollars, it's pretty much the same given what's happened to the pound, uh, you can come through the door and you can try a different approach. And actually so many people wanted to come through the door that I had to keep raising the price by the hour until we kind of basically had enough people. And people come through the door because they want to escape the stigma and the shame of standing in that queue. But they also come because they're absolutely convinced that standing in a queue with people who are just like them isn't going to help. And they're right. How did you find your last job? It's probably through somebody you know. Probably even if you filled out a, uh, you responded to an advert or you uh, met a headhunter, probably somebody connected you to that headhunter or showed you the advert. And everywhere in the world, it's the same. Eight out of ten jobs aren't advertised. So the best way to find work and the best way to progress in work is a really diverse network of social relationships. And everywhere we look, we see the same thing, from health to work to schools. We see that still today, we're relying on systems that were invented in the post-war period, and we're still investing in building these systems. Now, the post-war period was a time of huge explosion in new forms of social organisation. So we had the United Nations in 1945, we had the proliferation and the strengthening of the trades union movement, we had the foundation of Oxfam in 1942, and we had new forms of state welfare all across the world. And these new organisations were built to help spread the gains of the Industrial Revolution, the last Industrial Revolution, and they did transform lives. But today, we're going through a fourth industrial revolution. And these same systems don't work. We've got to radically reinvent how we frame the problem, how we design and implement the solutions, and how we collaborate for social change. So I started out working three decades ago in Africa and Latin America. I worked in places where poverty was acute and the need for change was really stark. And I worked with governments, I worked with non-governmental organisations, I worked quite a while with the World Bank. And everywhere I was part of these programmes that were designed to change the lives of others. And they looked great, these programmes, and I learned a lot from working on them. But what I observed was that again and again, the cultures and the mores of the institutions stopped change taking place. And that things that look really logical within our offices became something quite different in the process of implementation. And I thought I needed to step outside the institutions and I needed to learn again. I needed to kind of live other people's realities. I needed to understand their knowledge, their power. And so I moved to a barrio in the Dominican Republic. This is a network of uh, open sewers where 40,000 people live cheek by jowl together. Um, it's a place with quite a fearsome reputation. And I went there and I just lived there without an agenda, just observing, listening, being. And it was the start for me of developing a new way of working growing new approaches that I still use today. And these approaches are open, they're low cost, they're all about human collaboration. 
And what's important is that they don't start by saying, how can we fix existing institutions? They start in people's lives, in their homes, in their communities, and they say, what are you doing? What do you need? What do we need to flourish? And how can we build on that? So through this work, I meet people like Anne. Anne is unwell. She's overweight. She's in pain. Uh, she is so breathless, she can't walk to the bus stop just outside her house. She can't reach up to wash her own hair. And uh, she lives a life governed by illness. She has these nine specialist doctors, and going to meet the doctors really is a full-time job. But when I ask all the doctors to come together and meet me, they tell me something Anne already knows, which is that the drugs don't work. And Anne really represents the global health challenge, which is that we, all across the world, have health systems which are designed to combat infectious disease. But Anne, and billions more around the globe, are suffering from chronic conditions. I mean, in China alone, 385 million RMB, which is like the GDP of a small country, is spent on diabetes drugs. And we have these systems which were uh, designed in the post-war world. You're, you know, it's an industrial system. You're given a number, you're lined up, you're put on the conveyor belt, you're moved through the system. And these systems are very vertically organized. So you, you know, the nurse can do one thing, the doctor can do another thing. Power is concentrated at the top. This was the natural order, the natural hierarchy in the post-war world. And actually, these systems are very good at curing infectious disease. But today, 70% of the expenditure in our systems goes on those who can't be cured. Actually, I would argue that they can't even be well cared for in these industrial systems. So Anne, and people like Anne, need motivation, not medicine. And they need very new systems. They need these new horizontal networks, which will include professionals, but also neighbors, members in the community, people that can support you long term to work in a different way. And so I think that everywhere this is the case, that we need to really rethink our systems. And I think there are three reasons why. And the first is that in this century, we're facing different problems. Problems like aging and the isolation of the rural elderly in China, for example, international migration, chronic conditions, which I've already talked about, the challenge of living on a fragile planet. And I think what's important is not just that these problems were not foreseen by the architects of our social systems. It's that these problems are really different in nature. And they can't be solved by the command of a CEO or a, or a, a president, no matter how great they are as leaders. Because the nature of these challenges is that we need to work together to solve them. We need to participate. We need to collaborate. And yet all our post-war systems are designed really to keep us out, to keep us at arm's length where we can be managed. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is uh, changing social structures. So everywhere in the world, our systems still silently assume that women will do the work of care unpaid, for example, even though this is no longer the case. And there's something else, which is that I think that the post-war systems we have everywhere in the world have given us a blueprint of the mind. And I'm sure that everybody here has seen this blueprint in action. And what this mindset says is, OK, we might have problems, but these problems, being ill, being unemployed, are just kind of temporary deviations from a stable norm. And if we can just make a correction, everybody will get back on the path and everybody can continue as normal. We just have to treat these individual problems. But I think that the nature of change with this fourth industrial revolution is very different. I think it's constant, it's deep, and it's collective. So we need systems that can cope with this continual change, like continually moving between jobs. And then the third challenge is poverty. So the architects of our post-war systems thought that they would cure poverty. But actually, poverty is back. Inequality is growing. And it's also taking on new forms that weren't foreseen. So for example, in Britain, we have, and I think in many parts of the Western world, we have something which was not imagined, which is in-work poverty. Two thirds of British households receive welfare benefits because they're not paid enough to live on. And there's something else as well which is that modern poverty is actually as much about who we know, our relationships, as it is about money. So increasingly, social research is showing us that who we know is going to determine what kind of jobs we find, how we progress in that work, what kind of health care we receive, and who takes care of us at the end of our lives. But our existing welfare systems can't even see this kind of dynamic, let alone uh, find solutions to it. So I think we need to work in a very different way. We need to build different systems for this century. So what did I do that day with people in the job center? Well, I asked them all to come back and meet with me. And I said to them, what would you do? How can we build something different together? 
And this is the way that I work. I start very small, I tinker, I kind of do small things to see what works. It's kind of a digital way of working. Prototype something, it fails, it's very cheap to fail early, start again, keep inventing. And it's really the opposite to the way that our welfare systems and our social systems are currently designed, which is that we might go out to the community and we might ask people what they think, but then we take that knowledge back to our offices, we invent something new, and we kind of roll it out down this industrial production line and are kind of puzzled when it doesn't work, when it, it, it joins up with communities. So I created a new uh, service, if you like, a new response for people, new community for people in work, out of work, and in between. We get together in public places, and I design simple tools to kind of facilitate group exercises like getting to know one another and breaking down complex life challenges into small, doable chunks. And there's a lot of buzz, like when we meet together, it feels a bit like a cross between an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and speed dating, and everybody is kind of in there together. And what we don't do is what every uh, job service does around the world, which is say, how long have you been out of work, and what are your qualifications? Instead, we say to people, what do you dream of? And who is the first person that you need to meet to take the step towards that dream? And a randomized controlled trial of, the first of, of a group of just 2,000 of our first members showed that our approach costs one-fifth of any current approaches, that 54% of those who are long-term unemployed find work, 87 progress, and so on. And it's technology that makes these new systems possible. So with a very small team, we can connect to, so, say, 2,000 members in each community, which means that we've got lots of opportunities, lots of social relationships. The more people who are part of this network, the better and the stronger it is. And I use mobile phones, I use existing CRM systems that are very cheap, that I can hack. And in this way, as I say, we're kind of upending the business models and building in a different way. But I think what's really important is that this isn't some form of LinkedIn for the unlinked. It's about using technology to bring people together and make real human connections. Because if I know you, if you're a young person looking for work, trying to get your first job, I'll help you. If you're somebody whose skills don't work anymore, then I'm more likely to kind of work with you to help you along the path. And I've used this way of working in different ways. So for instance, with Anne, um, and patients like her, I set up in doctor surgeries and I say to them, can you send me your heart sink patients? And these are patients that have all kinds of health problems, social problems that doctors don't know what to do with. And what we design isn't condition specific. We start in people's lives and we say, what do you need to do to improve your life? And then what we do is we connect people to others because you can make change on your own, but you can't sustain change without good connections and without a community around you. So sometimes the remedies look really unorthodox. Anne, for example, said that she would like to take up her embroidery, her sewing again. And so, you know, we said, OK, and then her mood lifted and then she could take other steps. And so the clinicians are quite surprised by the kind of things that people do. But again, they're very impressed by the results which show sustained health improvement over time. And I've taken these approaches to looking at clean water and sanitation in Zambia, to working with families all across Europe that are locked out of their societies, and to inventing new approaches to supporting older people in a th rich third age. And all of this work tests a new framework. Six simple but powerful shifts, which I think, if we take together, could really make seismic change in our social systems. And the first one is to recover the vision. Because in the 1940s, the founders of the systems and the architecture of the organizations we have today thought very big. Facing the problems of war, recession, new industrial processes, they didn't say, oh, look, there'll be winners and losers. How can we take care of the losers? What they said was, how can we create a different world in which everybody flourishes? And I think everybody here is committed to that bigger question. But then comes the next question, which is, how can we actually do that in practice? And I think what we have to do is stop managing people's needs. We have to stop kind of taking care of people when they've already fallen over. What we need to do is create capabilities, the kind of core capabilities that all of us need to flourish. So how this works in the employment work I described, for example, is that we create communities and we ask people to stay with us. So when you find work, you stay in the community, you carry on accumulating skills, building your community, you can help others who are looking for work, you can get support with progressing to a better job, and then, as inevitably happens to all of us when we need to change our work again, you're already part of that community. 
This system also connects different forms of resource, some state funding together with private funding, with entrepreneurs, with citizens, because at the moment all of this resource we have is in silos that aren't connected. And we can use technology to kind of bring this money together, bring this resource together and use it in new ways. I focus on possibility. What can we solve rather than just how can we manage risk? And perhaps the most important thing is that these systems are open. They take care of everybody because the more people who join in, the richer it is, the more relationships, the more community we have. Now, I think that these new forms of support are everywhere, and perhaps many of you in this room have created your own form of what I'm talking about. But the problem at the moment is that these ways of working are marginal. They can't get access to funding, and they don't fit traditional me measurement frameworks. They often look very messy. But what I think we could do is that we could make a commitment to move this new work from the margins to the centre, and we would really make rapid change. We would really have a different social movement. So as I say, in the post-war world, with these new industrial systems, we invented a radical new architecture. And today, in this fourth industrial revolution, I think we need to commit to doing the same. Relationships underpinned by technology are the foundation stone. This would be the new operating framework of this social movement. So finally, just to finish up, I want to say five things that I think we could all do now to begin this change. So the first is we could reframe the problem. We could see what the problem is, not from the viewpoint of our institutions, but from everyday lives. We could work with people, give them a stake in framing the problem itself. Secondly, we need to expand the team. We need to expand who's working with us, communities, but also different disciplines. For too long, we've looked through the narrow economic lens as the only discipline, which is important, but it's not the only one. We need to think differently. Thirdly, we need to start with abundance. So I think what's really important is that this century, it's not only got new problems, but it's got new abundance. People, there's many of us, we're well-educated. We really want to join in if the systems are designed to allow us to do that. And technology is really important. At the moment, everywhere I go, I see that we're using technology to prop up old systems. We tag prisoners, for example, to stop them escaping rather than to support them to kind of be, you know, learn and to kind of grow new lives. So we need to use technology to underpin this new infrastructure. Fourthly, we need to reinforce relationships. So often when we invent social programs, what we do is we vertically slice through existing networks. So with everything we do, we need to ask, does this reinforce what's already strong and what's out there? And if it doesn't, we need to think again. And then finally, we need to invest in the future, in capabilities, in our capabilities. In the Second World War, after the Second World War, not everything was new. But what happened was that this new framework was created, this new operating system. And you went into it, and you received money and funding and so on, or you didn't. And so we need to create and sign up to this operating system here. And then I think we can really rapidly move to a different social world. So thank you so much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>